This reading is from Matthew 5, and it's a long chapter, so these are selected verses. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It has been said, Anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the oaths you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Laura. I'm hot. Just, just need to say that. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are four eyewitness accounts to the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And Matthew's gospel is one of them. And our reading this morning is a kind of cut and paste version of different verses from Matthew's gospel. And there are three chapters in Matthew's gospel, chapters five, six, and seven, which kind of summarize the call of Jesus' teaching. And it's called the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Mountain. And we looked at chapter five in detail in January uh, in the new year. But but we are going to be looking at the rest of it, chapter six and seven uh, during the autumn term. If you haven't watched any of our previous sermons on chapter five, I'd really encourage you to get up to speed to go on YouTube and um, you can watch some more there. So today we're reminding ourselves um, of what Jesus said in chapter five. And we're reorientating ourselves so that we're ready to do a deep dive into chapters six and seven, starting from next week. In Matthew 4, Jesus has just been baptized, and then he prepares for what lies ahead by spending 40 days in the desert before starting his ministry. And he's preaching and he's telling people, repent, like wake up, the kingdom of heaven is near. And he's calling his first few disciples, and they drop what they're doing and they follow him. And he travels around teaching and preaching and healing the sick. And people are coming from all over to hear him and to be healed. But in Matthew 5, Jesus goes up a mountain with his disciples, those closest to him who have left everything to follow him. And he was this young prophet with this explosive message. And he talks about social justice and money and sex and forgiveness and healing and our relationships. And what he says in these three chapters is controversial and it's challenging. And it's likely that if you haven't already been irritated by it, then then, there will be something that really ticks you off about what Jesus says in these three chapters. Because Jesus really gets into our business on the Sermon on the Mount. Six times in Matthew 5, he says, you've heard this, but I say this. And he urges them not to misunderstand God, not to misread what God has said in the Hebrew scriptures, but to listen to him, God in man, and what he is actually saying to us. 
You've heard it said that God doesn't exist, or you've heard it said that faith is a crutch, or you've heard it said that there's no rational reason why anyone could believe in God. You've heard it said that God is vengeful and angry. You've heard it said that church is full of do-gooders. You've heard it said that miracles don't happen. You've heard it said that prayer isn't real and that faith is just superstition. You've heard it said that you have to follow lots of rules and regulations to please God. But Jesus says that God created you and he loves you, that he sees you and he sees your circumstances, that he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And Jesus says in this teaching, you're not alone, God sees you. He says, take responsibility for your thoughts and your feelings. He says, deal with your anger so that you don't even get close to murder. He says, watch what you feed your mind so that you don't lust after what is not yours to have. He says, love your enemies. He says, the way up is the way down. And he says that those who mourn are blessed and seen by God. Jesus summons his disciples to a whole new way of being human. And he addresses all of that internal work that we need to do if our actions and our behaviors are ever going to change. He wants to form us from the inside out. You see, God in Jesus is committed to our transformation. He's not just in the business of improving our lives, tweaking them a little bit, but infusing our lives and changing our lives. And he called people then, and he's calling people now to a radical reorganization of our priorities and our goals. He's calling people to fullness of life, to a quality of life that can only be found in him. And in case you're thinking, well, this is fantastic. Where do I sign up? This is going to really enrich my life. What Jesus is talking about is a, involves a surrender of our kingdom, our plans, our sense of being right. Actually, it's costly and it's sacrificial. The way of Jesus is not a supplement that boosts our already quite good lives. It's not a bolt-on, it's not a hobby, and it's not about dabbling in spirituality. It's a commitment to a way of life. And it's a decision to follow a particular path that Jesus actually describes as the narrow way. It's characterized by obedience. Jesus in Matthew 16 says, set aside your your own stuff and follow me. If you give up your life for me, you're going to find it. He says in in Matthew 10, if you cling to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you'll find it. And all of this sounds super intense, I know, but it's actually the best news ever. Because what is weirdly true is that this decision today that Jade, Ian, Neil, Macy, and Yaz are all marking will bring about a fullness of life that just is not possible without God. Ask any of us in the room who've been on this journey for a while. Living life to the full does not mean an easy life. It doesn't mean life without troubles or problems, but it means that you have company on the journey. It means that you're equipped with the tools that can help you, and it means that you're not alone ever. When we give up our stuff, when we surrender to God, we find true life, full life. And we experience God's goodness and God's glory, and he sings over us. But this is not just about you and me and us as individuals. What Jesus says in these chapters of Matthew's gospel was not just a kind of individual ethic for each of us to kind of follow and go away and get on with our own pace. Like John the Baptist, Jesus was forming a new people. He was gathering people, new disciples around him. And he was forming a new community based on his teaching. And his teaching is backed up by every miracle and every healing and every encounter he has in the Bible. What he was doing is starting a movement and forming a new community, a new family of brothers and sisters in faith who embody this way, this teaching, and who journey together. So baptism is about us and our personal decision to journey in a particular direction, but it's also a recognition that when we come to faith, we're joining a new family, God's family. 
that we can do life together, that we can journey together, united by our faith in Jesus. And we are participating together in this new movement. So Jade, Ian, Yaz, Neil, and Macy, today you're being baptized. And as a marker, as a marker on this journey, you're publicly stating your intention to follow Jesus and this way of life, which ultimately will bring you life. But I want to leave you with one visual image this morning, which I hope might help you. Today, you're going to have a real high, and we're going to be celebrating and cheering, and it's going to be amazing. And you're going to feel close to God, and you're going to feel close to each other. But life is busy, and we all experience a lot of noise and distraction in our faith journey. You're going to experience demands and expectations from others. We have a sensory overload from social media. We have a lot of competing voices in our heads from our families, our friends, and our colleagues, saying to us, this is the way to go. You should do this. This is how to be happy. This will make you feel better. If this feels good, do this. And the busyness of routines and life and paying the bills and all of that represents noise that can and will try and crowd out your faith. Now, this is a metronome, and it helps musicians keep time. And it's noisy, you'll see this in a minute. It's a regular, consistent beating noise. And if it's helpful, I want you to imagine that this is God's heartbeat for you. This beat or this rhythm represents God's heart for you. His speaking to you. The fact that he is always there for you. It represents his love for you and his care for you that will never fail and will never stop. God's love will never diminish when you mess up. And God will always be calling you back to Jesus, back to prayer, back to this path that you are committing to follow today. And as disciples and followers of Jesus, your job is to listen for this beat, this rhythm in Jesus, and to follow it. This beat represents a call to prayer, to reading your Bible, to coming to church, and to being with other Christians. And so if and when you grow a bit deaf to this beat, come back. Because God will always be waiting with open arms. And if you mess up, listen to this rhythm and return to him. If you doubt or you experience tough times, remember that you're not alone. And let this beat remind you of God's heart for you. God's love for you will never fade. It will never stop. And it will always be there calling you back to him reminding you that you are known and that you are seen and that you are loved more than you can possibly know. Let's pray together. There may be people here today who feel that they've kind of got off the track a bit and want to return to that heartbeat, that rhythm of God, that call of God on their lives. There may be others here who want to kind of renew their commitment to following this beat, to following this way in their life. And as you talk to God, just offer up to him where you're feeling, what you're feeling today and where you're at. Lord Jesus, help us to surrender all that we are and all that we have. We want to follow you and we want to experience you in our lives. We want to experience the power and the presence of your spirit in us. So would you come and speak to each one of us today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you join me in standing as we sing together?